It is a pleasure to be here with Marilyn Houston. Um, as a journalist, she has been on my radar because of the six large defense companies in the world, three of them are now headed by women. And the largest of them The largest of them is Lockheed Martin, and their new CEO is Marilyn Houston. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Just to refresh everybody's memory, too, how big is Lockheed Martin, and what do you guys do? Well, we're $47 billion, and we're a technology leader. I know we talk a lot about technology, but our primary customer is US governments and international governments around the world. And what we do is global security, products and services, so we help protect citizens, and then we do a lot to help in terms of vital services for citizens through the uh, civil agencies. So aircraft, missile defense, sensors, things of that nature that help our men and women who are fighting for a peace and freedom, but also IT services for the U.S. government, we're the number one provider, uh, and a, a range of other services uh, across our civil agencies as well. You know, some people look at the defense industry and say it's the ultimate Boys Club. Um, you've been at Lockheed Martin for 30 years. How have things changed? First of all, I don't think it's the ultimate boys club anymore, if it ever was, but I would say it's changed a lot. We've got a lot of women in the pipeline over the years, and today at Lockheed Martin, and I'm sure it's true at, at many of the other companies within our industry, a quarter of our workforce is women. About a quarter of them are in leadership roles. We have women that are running large businesses. For me, you know, our largest business area is run by a woman. We have a uh, $9 billion business out there. We also have women that are running four and $5 billion businesses, our CIO, our chief counsel. So the whole range of um, senior leaders. And then throughout the business, there are women all across the five business areas in space systems and aeronautics and the IT business, as well as in our missiles and fire control and our mission systems and training business that are run by women. You and I talked, and uh, the F-35 is, is the largest uh, weapons program in US history. It's been criticized for its uh, waste and abuse. I want to let you talk about that and respond to that criticism. But I also just learned that program is headed by a woman. That's correct. That's correct. Lorraine Martin. And that's 15% of our sales. So a very large program that's growing dramatically over the next several years. Mm -hmm. Respond to that criticism that it has been a program that has been wasteful. I mean, it's a huge expense. Well, the F-35 is a very important program. This is a joint strike fighter. It's the next generation multi-role fighter. It's going to replace a lot of the current generation fighters. It's an important capability for the nation, and it's an important capability for our international partners. We have eight international partners, as well as two security cooperation partners that are involved in the program. Many of them invested on the front end because it's, it's something that's needed uh, across their businesses. It did have a rocky start to some extent because it's a complex, you know, when you're, you, when you're building a stealth aircraft that has sensor fusion that can address today's threats and future threats, there's a lot that goes into that development. But for the past three years, the program has been on an excellent trajectory. We're making good progress. We're flight test programs going well. In fact, we've had 10,000 hours of flight flying of the aircraft. We have just rolled out our 100th aircraft off the production line, so the production is ramping up. We're training pilots, we're training maintainers. The program's going well. I want to ask you about sequestration. Uh, that has greatly affected the defense industry, and also the government shutdown. You furloughed some 2,000 3, or 3,000 employees. When you see that a deal might be struck by the end of today, um, how much pain, though, has been done, and are you worried that this will only be a short-term fix? Well, there, it has been painful, and unfortunately, we have 2,000 employees, over 2,000, that are on furlough today. And that number will grow the longer that the government stays shut down. And that's just our company. I mean, this, this is affecting the entire, you know, the U.S. government employees as well as all of the suppliers and, and the industries that support the U.S. government. And, of course, our citizens. I mean, everybody's impacted by this government shutdown, services that are provided. So it's, it's a very serious situation and one that uh, we're very much troubled by. I am encouraged, as you said, Nora, that, that it looks like that we're going to get to some kind of a deal, and hopefully very soon, maybe as early as today. But that's just the first step. I mean, there's more to do. But when Marilyn Houston of Lockheed Martin calls up a member of Congress, they take your call. Because, <laughs> because you're with Lockheed Martin and you're Marilyn Houston and the Defense Secretary. What kinds of concerns have you expressed to them? 
Well, a lot of what I've been talking to our lawmakers about is this whole issue of sequestration. This across the board cut, the, the, and it's a law right now, and it's a, a policy that is not good for our nation. It's not good for national security. It affects not only the defense, but non-defense capabilities. When you just do a, across the board with, no, with indiscriminate to what it impacts, that is not good business. And we need to address our long-term fiscal problems in this nation. We certainly have to address that, but we, don't, we need to do it in something that lines up with our national security strategy, with our strategy for providing citizen services. We need to recognize that these are jobs that will be impacted in that are high paying jobs, high tech jobs. Much of what the defense industry and other industries do that support the US government are innovation and technology that has far reaching help across the nation. You think about GPS. I mean, you know, when you get lost and you need an app system in that GPS, I mean, that, that is a system that Lockheed Martin has provided and we're working on the next generation of that. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you're, you, know, you pull out your phone and you want to know what the weather is, we put those NOAA satellites out there that allow you to do that. The air traffic management system that allows you to fly safely around the nation, Lockheed Martin is involved in that. So it's much more than what many people stop to think about as how far reaching this is mm -hmm. for our nation. You were number four this year on the most powerful women list. When you look and see that you're number four, what do you think? I think it's a great tribute to Lockheed Martin. Uh, it's a strong company that is, we have a very broad and strong portfolio. We're performing well as a company and I have the, certainly the privilege to serve in the role as a CEO to, so I think it's really a tribute to the 116,000 men and women of Lockheed Martin that the company is recognized in such a way. Mm -hmm. Something uh, interesting I learned about you is that uh, your father died when you were nine years old and there were five children and your mother a single mom who worked and raised all five of you. How did she do it? My mom's amazing. She's living today. She's 94 years old, still lives alone, and, uh, and is just an incredible woman, I would say. But she had children between the ages of 5 and 15 at a very young age that, uh, that she worked two jobs and, and worked her way and always told us we could do anything that we put our minds to as long as we worked hard. And I think instilled in her children and, and through her resilience and her determination, I think has just done a remarkable thing. And I, you know, I, I know you all probably think of your parents as role models. Certainly, she was a role model for me as I faced challenges in my business. And uh, I always had her say, you know, you have a job to do. It's your responsibility. Just go do it. And so, you know, self-talk says, you have a job to do. Just go do it, you know. One of the great stories about Marilyn is that her mother would hand her a grocery list. She was in charge of getting the groceries for all her brothers and sisters and hand her a list which had about $7 worth of groceries and she would hand her a $5 bill <laughs> and say what? <laughs> and she'd say, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can make this work and bring home. <laughs> so she ta taught me at a very young age how to economize and look at you know, the prices on things and figure out how to do that and manage through it. And so her expectation was, I don't want to hear excuses. Just handle it. Mm -hmm. And what do you think are the leadership lessons that you learned from your mother in growing up that way? Because it sounds like you were very independent at a young age and you had a lot of responsibility at a very young age. You know, I would say that's what it is. is uh, you know, I was the middle child but the oldest girl, so I had two younger daughters. And my mother, you know, overwhelmed by the situation with five children, she had to figure out the financials and run the household in that way. So she basically said, I need your help. You know, look after the, the younger daughters. So, you know, it taught me that sense. But the other thing that it taught me was self-reliance. Because this you know, was knocked the props out from under her at a point in her life when, you know, she was, you know, she had, uh, my dad was a successful uh, man and, and all of a sudden there she was. And I think it taught me that nothing's forever and you, opt you have to look out for yourself. And I, I became much more self-reliant, I think as a result of that. You have been at Lockheed Martin uh, for nearly three decades. Um, you had 19 different positions. You moved your family eight times. That's a lot. Why did you do that? Well, you know, Lockheed Martin is a large corporation and, and I think each one of us is looking at, you know, what, how do we continue to progress in our careers? For me, uh, I had opportunities that were presented to me that allowed me to get increasing responsibility and so, 
uh, because we have a broad geographic area, that meant opportunities to move to other parts of the business. I worked in four of the five business areas. I worked at our corporate office, and that meant moving my residents to do that. Uh, I think it's, you know, to do that, you need a supportive family, and my family was very supportive through that process, but it helped me to get a collection of experience that I think prepared me for the next job. And we, we often look at talent development at Lockheed Martin, and one of the most important things on that is getting experience and getting a breadth of various experiences so that when you face that next new issue, challenge, opportunity, that you can draw on that collection of experiences. Of the 47 billion, Lockheed Martin, um, what percentage of it is uh, overseas? And how much of that will you grow in the future given the domestic cuts here at home that have to deal with the sequestration? Well, you know, our do domestic business is not gonna grow at the same trajectory. You're certainly right about that as we look at the defense budget. We're growing our international business. Today it's about 17% of our sales. We're gonna grow to at least 20% or more. And there is a lot of demand for our products and capabilities around the world. We've been doing business internationally for years. We're in over 70 countries. But there is a strong demand for our missile defense, for our tactical aircraft, for our air mobility, for our cybersecurity capabilities. There's a lot of demand for our products and capabilities. So we're focusing resources and, and our talent on that marketplace. We have an opportunity if anybody wants to ask a question from the audience uh, for Marilyn Houston. Right over here. Karina Estrella, Egon Zender. Um, in the role I'm in, I have the privilege to see succession planning across a large number of corporations. Yours is somewhat unique with a number of women in very key roles, running very large parts of your business. Can you talk a bit more about what a, how that's transpired over the years, how that came about? Sure. We Talent management in our business is very important. and and as it relates to succession planning to move into various jobs. And we've put in place uh, very significant um, programs across our businesses. But at my level, my, the, my top team, we look at our general manager and program manager capabilities, uh, the whole pipeline of leaders moving into various roles. On an ongoing basis, we look at not only who's ready for the next job, but what kind of leadership development do they need? What would be the right moves for various people's, people to be moved into the next job? So it is, it is ingrained throughout our company. We've set in place a set of leadership behaviors that we look for across our, our leaders called full spectrum leadership. And we, and we look for getting not only people that can deliver results in the business, but also have the whole range of capabilities from shaping the future, from looking at how to build effective relationships, from modeling accountability and ethics and their performance focus, so how they work effectively with teams. And that's the kind of thing that we look for getting experience and developing people to move forward in. I think, I, you know, I'm a, certainly a product of that succession planning process because because of, as, as Nora said, having the opportunity to move to a lot of different locations within the business and a lot of different uh, positions across the business. And that's the kind of experiences that we're, that we're trying to get in place so that we get our leaders ready for their next job. I think we have time for just one more question right over here. Yes, this is Kay Koplovitz. I am um, very interested in sort of the challenges that are out there in private uh, companies that are race to you know outer space service uh, to shuttle uh, service from X Prize things like this. Do you see this as a good innovation for your business, a challenging innovation for business that you might have? What are your thoughts about sort of the private enterprise? challenges that are going on to solve some of the issues that we have in space? Well, you know, space business is a very important element of our business. We've been involved in it for many years, both from launch, launching space vehicles as well as, you know, building satellites and putting satellites out across the world. We're working on Orion, which is, you know, the next exploration, human uh, exploration vehicle that's a replacement for the shuttle. So we're involved in a lot of those activities. There are a lot of companies that are looking at ways to move forward in that. If I understand your question, you know, my view is that uh, from the pri as private industries and other industries move into that space, I mean, I think it makes sense. Technology for our country is so critically important and innovation 
that when we invest for the, into those areas, that's what's going to make us stronger. A lot of products that have come out of the space business uh, are what we use today. So it's a, it's a critical area. Uh, we love competition. So, uh, you know, so I think it's competition is what our, our, our business uh, in the United States is based on. And so I think, I think it's very healthy investing in technology and, and competing and getting the best product forward. Marilyn Houston, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.